Now, let's talk a bit about the pancreas. Okay? And we'll talk more about the thigh mist when we get into immunology. Okay? All right. But the pancreas is pretty big now. Pancreas is located inferior to the um, inferior to the stomach. And it sits right in here. We got the head portion of the pancreas that kind of sits right in the first part of the small intestines, and then we got a tail that's kind of like underneath the um, underneath the stomach. All right. Now, as an exocrine gland, it's going to produce and release a lot of enzymes. Like I said before, an exocrine gland means that there's a duct there, some kind of tubular structure that open, that ends up into an open cavity. This open cavity would be the small intestine. And it's going to produce a lot of enzymes that go through here. Now, we're not going to talk about these, the, the exocrine portion right now. We'll get into that with the digestive system. But the pancreas is what we consider to be a dual organ meaning it has an exocrine portion and there's an endocrine portion, okay? Um, and I want to spend time talking about the endocrine portion also because these hormones that it releases does not go through the duct, it actually goes directly into the bloodstream. So the endocrine gland, it releases three hormones. One of them is called glucagon. Now, glucagon is not hormonally controlled. In other words, it doesn't have another hormone to help glucagon to come out. Instead, it has some other non-hormonal substance, as much as we saw calcium, a non-hormonal substance, tell PTH or calcitonin to come out, we now have something called glucose, a non-hormonal substance that's going to tell glucagon to come out. How much is what the key is. If glucose is very low in the bloodstream, it's going to tell glucagon to come out to put glucose into the bloodstream. So how do you visualize this? Well, there's something called glycogen, and be careful these words. There's glycogen and there's glucagon, two different things, okay? So we have glucagon, and that's the hormone, and then we have glycogen. And that is, oh, you're going to hate this word, a polysaturide. All right? Basically, it's long, long chains of glucose. Think of a big iceberg of glucose. So what's going to happen here is that glucagon, because low levels of glucose, are going to tell glucagon to go to a place where it has glycogen. Where is glycogen located? In the liver and in some muscles. The liver is loaded with glycogen. And it's a big iceberg. So what's going to happen is gly um, I gotta be careful what I'm saying this. glucagon is a big iceberg. And it's going to go to this iceberg of glycogen, and little ice cubes of glucose will go into the bloodstream from that iceberg. That's what glucagon does. It's going to do everything it can to put glucose into the bloodstream because low levels of glucose told glucagon to come out. Is that clear? The iceberg is glycogen. The big storage area of glucose. Glucagon is going to chip away at that iceberg so that little ice cubes of glucose go into the bloodstream. Okay? That's glucagon. Glucagon increases glucose levels in the bloodstream. Then we have one that I know everybody in this room has heard about, insulin. Insulin is going to get released from the pancreas when levels of glucose in the bloodstream are very high. So it's very similar to calcitonin and PTH. When we refer to calcium, glucagon and insulin will do the same thing with glucose. High levels of glucose in the bloodstream, insulin comes out. Low levels of glucose in the bloodstream, glucagon comes out. Okay? 
Now this is what's happening. That hallway over there is your bloodstream. You're in a cell. And there is a door here. The door is closed. The students that are out there in the hallway, each student is a glucose molecule. There's 10 students out there. They can't get inside. So 20 students go out there. 30 students. 50 students. The bloodstream is getting compounded, and more glucose is going to the bloodstream. Does that make sense? It's piling up. Someone in the hallway is going to say, hey, look, we need to call security because they have the insulin keys to unlock the door, open it up, and now sugar comes in, glucose comes in. Insulin does not go inside the cell. Insulin is going to unlock the doors when high levels of glucose are in the bloodstream to make the glucose pour inside the cell. And what is that going to do to the amount of glucose in the bloodstream? Decrease it. Insulin decreases glucose in the bloodstream by that way, unlocking the doors. Does that make sense? That's what insulin does. Now, let's talk a little bit about diabetes, and what that is, okay? I know everybody here either, either has diabetes or knows someone that has diabetes. And if not, it's all over the news, right? One of the top 10 killers in America. So you need to understand the concept of what diabetes is. And it's a very easy understanding. There's two types of diabetes. One, type one, is for some reason this person is not producing insulin. That's the rare form. For some reason in the pancreas, the body's destroying the cells to not make insulin. So those people will have to be on insulin for the rest of their lives. That's type one, okay? More or less, the more common one is the one that you hear about a lot more, type two diabetes, okay? Type two diabetes is also referred to as insulin resistant diabetes. Their body is making insulin. So where's the problem? Here's the problem. The keyhole, the receptor. Somebody put silly putty over this keyhole. Somebody put super glue in this keyhole. So now the sugar goes up in the bloodstream in the hallway. They call the security to bring the insulin keys, their body's making insulin, now they can't get it into the receptor. There's some kind of maj page on here, there's something that's goof that they can't get it in there. So the receptors are resistant to the insulin. So these people are making insulin, they just have problems having the insulin work. Is that clear? Now, what do you do? Okay. Meanwhile, the sugar's going up and up and up. The body knows about it. So what are they going to do? If one security guard is trying to get this in here, what do you think that security guard is going to do? He can't get his insulin key to work. What is he going to do? He has a little walkie-talkie. What's he going to do? He's going to ask for backup. Guys, my key's not working over here. Can you bring a couple other guys here with insulin keys? You need to give that person more insulin. Now, when you have six or seven people, the security guards here, with six or seven keys of insulin, chances are they're going to find a way to open up that door. Does that make sense? All right? You have to, otherwise the person's going to die. You've got to have some sugar going in. Otherwise, remember how to make ATP, right? That's what makes you energy. You need oxygen and you need glucose. If you don't have glucose coming to the cell, you're dead. All right? So insulin has to open up the key, or open up the door, to allow the glucose to come in. Does that make sense so far? All right, that's, that's diabetes. Now here's where another problem is. Door's closed. In, inside the cell needs glucose. It doesn't know, the cell doesn't know why there's no glucose coming into the cell. 
It doesn't know that there's how much glucose is out there. It doesn't have little windows to see what's outside in the bloodstream. They just know inside the cell there's no glucose and it needs to make ATP, otherwise its body's going to die. So it sends a message to the brain, say, hey, look, I don't know why there's no glucose coming in. Uh, brain, you better do something about it. And they say, well, why don't we make, maybe there's, maybe for some reason the glucose isn't coming in because there's probably no glucose out there. So how do you get more glucose into the bloodstream? You get hungry. That's where the problem is. It's hard to control diabetes. Because if the glucose isn't coming in, the person's going to get, the appetite's going to grow. And they're going to want to eat more. Which means that there's going to be more glucose. That's how the glucose in the bloodstream goes up and up and up. You see the problem? It's a vicious cycle that keeps on going. Now, you can control diabetes by diet alone. Just watch the foods that you're eating, how much, and exercising. If that doesn't work, excuse me, if that doesn't work, the next thing you do is that you give certain oral pills. And there's a many, there's metformin, there's a lot of different pills out there. Ones that'll make glucagon come out. Ones that'll slow down. Ones that'll make insulin come out more out of the... Um, out of, the, out of the pancreas. So there's a lot of different medications that'll do that, which I'm it's over the scope of this course. But they're going to first try and see the control by diet. The next step is that they'll control with oral medication. And if that doesn't work, then they're going to give you insulin. Now here's a little pity on this. What's putting all this poop on this block? I'm sorry? Excess of glucose. If there's a lot of glucose out there, there's going to be more goop on here. So the more glucose there, you're going to make this more and more resistant to insulin. So eventually, as this person's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because there's so much sugar out there, it's stored in the adipose tissue, they're going to get hungrier and hungrier. Eventually, these people are going to have to be put on insulin because one security guard with an insulin fee is not going to do any justice. You've got to get about 10 people over there, which means you've got to get more exogenous or more uh, insulin from outside the body to come in. And they're going to have to give insulin shots, injections, to get that up there. Does, does that make sense? Now, here's also a little tip for you guys. I absolutely guarantee that a person who has diabetes and is on insulin and they lose 50 to 60 pounds, they will be off of insulin. They'll still be a diabetic and you'll still have to control it with diet or pills, but they'll be off the insulin because there won't be that much goop on those insulin receptors. But you still have to control it by diet or something. The person's still a diabetic. But you don't need all this extra insulin. I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, not type 1. Type 1 will always need insulin because their body can't produce it. Does that make sense? I went slow with you on that because I definitely want you to understand about diabetes. There's going to be questions on the test and uh, for the rest of your careers. Because you'll deal with diabetes moving forward. Any questions about diabetes? Okay, now let me get back to this. So, what makes glucagon come out is low levels of glucose in the bloodstream. What makes insulin come out is high levels of glucose in the bloodstream. The problem is, the way this is set up, is that when glucagon comes out, it can, keeps on coming out. Come out, come out, come out. And it doesn't stop. And when insulin comes out, it keeps on coming out, coming out. It doesn't know when to stop. So we have another hormone called somatostatin. When the glucose levels are at adequate area, 
then somatostatin is going to tell glucagon to stop coming out. When insulin does its job and the glucose is up to its regular area, then somatostatin is going to tell insulin to come out. So it's going to do that. Now somatostatin is a paracrine, meaning it comes from the pancreas and tells another cell what to do. It tells another cell what to do. It doesn't need to go into the bloodstream. So why is somatostatin known as a hormone if it's also a paracrine? Because somatostatin is also going to go into the bloodstream and it's going to go to the, the anterior pituitary and tell GH, growth hormone, also to stop coming out when it gets too much. So it gets a little confusing. And there's also a hormone that comes out of the hypothalamus that's called, known as growth hormone inhibiting hormone. And that's the same thing as somatostatin. So there's two things that are going to inhibit growth hormone to come out. Something from the hypothalamus and something from the pancreas. It just makes us realize and appreciate that our bodies are so complicated. Okay? Yes? So, because somatostatin is also a hormone and part of the endocrine system, can you why do you think when the somatostatin is secreted, does it automatically affect who's on its own and growth hormone? And does it have the ability to... Only, only if those cells are... Remember we're talking about upgraded and downgraded? Mm -hmm. Only if those cells are upgraded and they need more growth hormone to come in there. I'm sorry, sorry. If they're downgraded uh, and they don't need any more growth hormone to go to those cells. Your body has a way of adjusting itself to okay. know which receptors are going to be more responsive to somatostatin or not. Okay. Okay? But when they're dealing with, when somatostatin deals with insulin and glucagon, it's acting as a power cream. But when it goes into the bloodstream and goes to the anterior pituitary, it's, it's, it's a hormone. So it works in both ways. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. So really quick about glucagon. This is kind of like review kind of stuff that I just explained. Uh, it's a polypeptide. It's a hyperglycemic agent. Right? It's sugar. It's going to, well, it's not sugar, but it's going to put sugar into your bloodstream. So it's going to put... That's why it's called hyperglycemic, glycine glucose. So it's going to put more glucose into your bloodstream. All right? Its major target is liver, where glycogen is, right? And also some muscle that has glycogen. And the functions, it does these things over here. I'm not going to go into the details about it. You've had it in AMP1 or before that, but it's going to do glycogenolysis, which means it's going to break, lysis means to break down glycogen. So it's going to break down glycogen to make glucose. That's what that is, right? All right? It's going to do gluconeogenesis. That's gluco meaning glucose, neo meaning new, genesis, formation, synthesis. So you're going to make new glucose by other sources than glucose or sugars, meaning like they'll take amino acids and they're going to make glucose. What I'm trying to show you here is that glucagon will do everything in its power to try and get glucose into the bloodstream. Whether it's breaking down glycogen or just making new glucose from other sources. Okay? Just keep alert to these things here. I put it in white so you can see it. All right? I don't want you to do um, careless mistakes on exams by just reading things fast. Glycogen, glucagon, glucose, we're going to talk about glucocorticoids, and glucagon in the digestive system. Glue, 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 glue. All right? So just be aware of that. Now, insulin is also a protein hormone. All right? It's a hypoglycemic agent. It's going to do what it can to decrease the amount of glucose in the bloodstream to put it back onto glycogen, put it back onto that iceberg of glucose, or, and or, put the glucose into the blood, oh, I'm sorry, into the cells themselves by unlocking the doors and doing that. Either way, it's going to get glucose out of the bloodstream. So it's going to decrease glucose levels, it's going to transport um, glucose into the body cells by opening those doors, okay? So this is just a summary of it all. And um, this. So what's going to happen here? If you have 
have low blood sugar. That's going to make the pancreas spit out glucagon to go into the liver to break down glycogen and put glucose into the bloodstream. And that means the blood sugar will go up. If it gets too high, then it's going to tell the pancreas to release insulin to open up the doors to allow glucose to go into the tissues or and or it's going to go and target the liver to get the glucose and put it back on the iceberg of glucose, which is glycogen. Either way, both of those ways actually, is going to lower blood sugar. If it gets too low, then it just repeats. Teeter totter. Does that make sense? Okay, it's very similar to uh, calcium in the way we control that. Now, histology of the pancreas, we don't have good slides of it, but you do need to understand the concept of this. So I want to go over this with you because, like I said, diabetes is one of the top 10 killers in America. You'll be hearing these words throughout the rest of your medical careers. So let's just give you a brief synopsis of what the histology is here. So you see new advancements in medical technology to say why are they going to certain cells to help uh, treat and uh, cure diabetes. So the pancreas is broken down into two things. The pancreas itself have our center cells, and that makes up about 99% of the pancreas. And this is what's responsible for in terms of making all the enzymes. This is the exocrine portion of the pancreas, okay? <clears throat> then we have things called islets of Langerhans. This only makes up 1% of the pancreas. It's a very small percentage, but this is what's responsible for the endocrine portion of the pancreas, okay? It only makes up 1%. These islets of Langerhans are scattered throughout but if we condense them and push them off into one corner, it's only going to make up 1% of this entire pancreas. Small section for such a big responsibility. The rest of it, the 99%, is going to make all the different enzymes, which we'll get into with the digestive system later on. Okay? But in these islets of Langerhans, there's four different cell types. Two major ones I want you to understand, but there's a total of four. There's alpha cells, and the alpha cells are responsible for making glucagon. Then we have beta cells, and this is going to be responsible for making insulin. Those are the two I really want you to understand. Then we got delta cells, make some acetone that cells and do this other thing. But Beta cells and alpha cells, these are the ones you're going to hear a lot when we're talking about with diabetes in all your future careers. Type 1 diabetes is that your body, we talked about this in terms of uh, the thyroid and Graves' disease, it's an autoimmune antibody where in Graves' disease it is going to make, your body makes a certain antibody to attack and turn on your thyroid, right? But what's happening here is that your body is going to make a certain autoantibody in type 1 diabetes, and it attacks and destroys the beta cells. So therefore, in these people of an autoimmune disease, as in type 1 diabetes, they can't make insulin because their beta cells have been destroyed. That's what that is. So you bet. There's a lot of advancements and a lot of learning, that there's a lot of research, that if we take beta cells from a donor, maybe even from a pig, and take them and put them to type 1 diabetic patients, that maybe it could produce insulin. That's what they're going to be talking about. When you get into your courses later on, they're going to be talking about that. Okay? So that's what I want you to understand with that. All right? Not too much. And this is, if you look at this, this is a close-up. This is an islet of Langerhans. You can see this whitish area here. And inside this, and all these darker areas, this is a center cell. This is what's responsible for making 
uh, enzymes from the pancreas. But this area here is what's going to be made, and this is just one of many places in the pancreas. But this islet of Langerhan is going to make, um, have beta cells and, and alpha cells, which you wouldn't have to identify. I'm not going to ask you about that. But you should know that alpha and beta cells are found in the islets of Langerhan, and they're responsible for making insulin and glucose. Okay, um, I just want to just reiterate, and I'll let you guys go. Deficiency of insulin is diabetes mellitus, not diabetes insipidus. That's a decrease of ADH. That's different. This is diabetes mellitus. This is the number one endocrine disease that we have out there right now. All right, next to Graves' disease or thyroid diseases. Risk factor is the number one risk factor for coronary artery disease. Which talk about when we get to cardiology, and is the seventh pillar in America. You bet there's going to be a lot of talk with diabetes, if you haven't heard already, with all your future classes, okay? When you have a decrease of insulin, your glucose goes up, you have hyperglycemia, and you get these things here, glycosuria. There's so much glucose in the bloodstream that for every molecule of water that, I'm sorry, for every molecule that glucose goes out in the bloodstream, because your glucose can't get all reabsorbed. It, 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 there's just too much. So if they only have, let's say, 100, I'm just giving you numbers, 100 carriers to get glucose back into the bloodstream, and you have 250 glucose molecules in the kidney, only 100 can go back. That means 150 are going to spill out in the urine. Does that make sense? You should not have glucose in the urine. And for every molecule of glucose that goes in the urine, one molecule of water has to go out there to keep the concentration. So these people tend to pee a whole lot. So they have glycosuria, which is glucose in the urine. They get polyuria, a lot of urine, but mellitus means sweet tasting urine, because there's sugar in there. They get polydipsia, they're losing all this water, so they get really thirsty. And polyphagia, they get hungry for that reason I explained to you about before. So these are signs you should know. These are signs that you should pick up with your own wife, your husband, your mother, and see if these are things that you're noticing with them. And say, hey, look, why don't you get your glucose level checked? Okay? The three types, I'm not going to go into the first type, gestational diabetes occurs in pregnancy. The only thing I want to say about that is that 20% uh, of the women who have gestational diabetes become diabetics themselves later on in life. Not the children, the mothers who had diabetes during those nine months. So we like to watch those. It's, it's important. If you, have, if you have diabetes during pregnancy, we will check you uh, every year to check you don't have the diabetes. One out of five women who have gestational diabetes become diabetic themselves. Then we have type 1 diabetes. Like I said, it's an autoimmune disease. This is where the beta cells get destroyed. For We don't understand why it happens. We know how it works. But that's what's happening. They get no insulin whatsoever, so they will be on insulin for the rest of their lives. But this here, type 2 diabetes, this is what grandma's got. This is the more common one. It's insulin resistant. They make insulin, they just don't make enough. Okay? And that's what happens there. Risks that are related here is age, obesity, and family history. And this is just breaking up type 1 and type 2. All right, a little chart over there to help you with that. And these are people that have uh, diabetes. I'm sure you know him. Uh, she has type 1 diabetes, Halle Berry. Also, if you have diabetes and you try to get pregnant, it's usually a very difficult thing to try and get pregnant. And if you followed her, she, she got pregnant, but she had a slew of doctors with her trying to get her pregnant with, with the infertility clinics and stuff. Very difficult. And then these two people also have diabetes. Okay?